We broke it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Red Thread Studio fans and Cottage Guard um, Threads fans, we are back. <coughs> back here. So let us know in the comments if you can see us. Um, the comments here we have are the folks that commented before we joined. We got some thumb up. We've got a heart. Great. Okay, so we have folks here. Let me just do a quick rewind and introduce the lovely ladies, the mother-daughter duo from Cottage Garden Threads, uh, nestled in the hills um, of Victoria, Australia, are coming to join us today and tell us a little bit about the history. We started off with asking uh, where they were born and raised. And there's some local girls, they're country girls, um, up in the hills and in, in, uh, the mountains, um, surrounded by beautiful flora and fauna that have proved to be inspirational. Um, and I was about to go uh, before the stream dropped here on Facebook and to ask them to, Pam, if you would share us a bit about your stitching journey. How did you learn to embroider? Well, it would have to go back to probably before I even started school from my mother and my nana who uh, started my stitching career and knitting career and mm -hmm. anything textile, anything textile. So I owe it all to them really and I've just kept going. Anything textile I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's just your way of creating and that was the medium available to you? Yes, yes, basically, yes. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I've done a lot of work in aged care and it's a good release from any pressure that you have in your day job. Mm -hmm. uh, now, my day job is this. <laughs> so it, it took quite a few years to get here, but uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. So now my life is all about textile. Yeah. yeah. And then, Katie, did you learn from your mom? How to yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, same thing. I can't even remember how young I was when I first learnt. I remember being in before, well before school and having to ask mm -hmm. mum to thread my needle all the time because I couldn't get it uh, through the eye. And I think at that stage you actually had a you had a fabric shop. I did. Fabric shop. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's in my DNA as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I started. That was more um, hand sewing and kind of dressmaking and then I started embroidery maybe as a teenager and mm -hmm. and then it really kicked off when I joined mum here mm. with Cottage Garden Threads and then that really got me started with a lot more embroidery. But previous to that, it was more dressmaking and, yeah. Garment sewing and, yeah, that's great. And then, Pam, did you um, just, what, what made you just start, decide to start dyeing your own threads doing hand dyed threads was it something out of necessity or were you experimenting how, how did you find that path well I started a very good friend of mine uh, who is a, a an embroiderer uh, and designer who asked me if I would dye her some thread because the availability here in Australia wasn't great so I started off with 30 different skeins I thought she assured me that it wouldn't be that hard mind you she'd never done anything like this ever before herself but uh, I thought I'd give it a go and that was 15 years ago so 16 years ago how long 15 yeah about 15 forget. yeah well before yeah it would have been 16 or so yeah years ago. yeah, yeah when so you were very first mm. yeah so I actually started for her because of her embroideries and her designs and uh haven't stopped since so it's grown very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the colours I take from life in general, anything I see, anything. Uh, I have had a lot of people that have asked me that have designed their own fabrics if I would design a thread to go with those. So that's how that colour is born. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different uh, mm -hmm. ways the colour is born. And, um, and the edit ranges. And the edit ranges. Yeah. I've had other people have designed what they've wanted in a range of threads so I've tried to uh, accommodate that and it's works well so far so we keep going if it ain't broke you don't fix it don't fix it my understanding is it was uh, humble beginnings you started in a kitchen sink I did 
I did. It's, I started on my kitchen sink and uh, then I moved to, um, I had a big garage, car garage, which I uh, lined and moved out there and then we had to move again to accommodate staff and the size of the business. So we moved into a very old building in our town, uh, which works very well, but we've now had to expand again. Uh, so we have another very old building, which we work out of as well. Mm -hmm. so we keep. I think we've got to stop expanding now. I don't know where else we could go. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, so far it's working well. Well, you do know your threads are hitting mainstream here in the United States. So lovely. Very exciting. Very, very yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah. So we've got um so we've got a our main division here which is is the threads um and accessories and products. And then in a different location we have the Field Journal Club. So that um division on its own is run from a, a different location because that takes up quite a bit of um space and it's always go and very busy and everything and, and same here. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, so that the person mum mentioned was Brenda Ryan. So she has her own edit range, the traditional range. Um, yeah, so she's still a huge part of the business today. Huge. Yeah, and um, huge. she's teamed up with a friend of hers, Joe Maxwell, to create the Hare's Nest um, as well. So, and we distribute their, um, their beautiful curated kits and products as well. So, yeah, we've got that and we do distribute for mm -hmm. a couple of different designers as well. Fantastic. So what would you say, Katie, is the best part about being a mother-daughter duo? Um, the best part is we complement each other because we're, we're alike in a lot of ways, but different in a lot of ways as well. So mm -hmm. um, we work really well as a team um, because our strengths are sometimes in different places and, you know, but still we're very similar. I can hear me coming out of your my, <coughs> you coming me. out of my mouth all the time, especially when I'm telling my kids off. Um, but yeah, it's it's good, and we we get well, on really well. We do. Yeah. For me, because we work in different areas in the business, and for me, I mean, Katie's an absolute godsend because of her young ideas, which I don't have so much. Uh, I've always been very hands on and get in and do the work. Whereas there's got to be somebody that can uh, think of all these wonderful things that, you know, we do with our threads and the marketing. And so for me, she's a godsend. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm very lucky, very fortunate to have a girl that I've got. Yeah. And all the girls that work for us are amazing. And amazing. I, I definitely like getting into operations and systems and things like that, as well as the creative side. Um, I'm a total geek when it comes to manufacturing and, and systems and processes. I love that side of it as well. So do you guys, you ladies actually do the dyeing yourselves or is, is someone in the organization uh, doing managing that at the moment? I've done the dyeing for 15 years and uh, on my own. I've been the only dyer until last year. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to work for a while due to health reasons. And uh, I have a young girl that started with us, um, well, sort of the, during COVID, and uh, she has taken on the role mm. of being the head dyer, and I am thrilled. So what? Absolutely thrilled to be. When um, so when Mum couldn't work anymore, and being a sole dyer for thirteen years, and all of a sudden, mm. um, and we knew for a while we needed to prepare and get ready to so that mum could have eventually um retire and, and uh, yeah. enjoy life mm -hmm. so we knew that we would need to get someone in and the traditional thought was that we would need an apprentice to train up in the art of of dying um but then that couldn't happen because mum was just very suddenly taken out of the situation so i literally had to jump in um and I knew, I knew what to do because because of my fascination with processes and systems, and I've always been asking Mum really irritating questions about why she does <laughs> things a certain way. Um, so I knew the method and I knew I knew the practice, but so much of it was still in Mum's head 
Um, so I had to kind of get that all out of mum's head and put that into processes. And then we thought, well, instead of having this reliance upon one more person, um, why don't I make it so that anyone can step in and then learn that system? Mm-hmm. So we actually have multiple people in the mm. business who, who can die. And there's always two now in there, a dyer and an assistant, um, because it was just when I got in there um, and was doing it on my own and, and doing it the way mum was doing it, um, I was just absolutely amazed that mum has been, it's just such a labour intensive um, process. So um, kind of changed things around a bit while she wasn't in here to tell me not to. And um, yes, made it so that it wasn't quite as physical, um, mm-hmm. taking such a physical toll on the body um, and definitely having two people in there really helps with that. So mm-hmm. there's always um, most on on heavy, like uh, really busy days, there's two people in there doing the dying and assisting. And yeah, so that when I was, um, it was fantastic when I was in there doing the dying and um, I got a phone call from the school and I had to go and pick one of my kids up. They were sick and I literally took off my apron and handed it to someone else and they could jump straight in and um, and just carry on where I um, where I left off. So production didn't stop at all and that's the way that we can have uh, so much coming out of this small space mm-hmm. that we're in because we make sure that there's a continuity and that, um, yeah, people can, we can just pivot very quickly, very easily if if someone has to have downtime. That's that's yeah. fantastic because it's, it, you really, you're seeing your evolution, right? As, starting mm-hmm. from the kitchen sink and as you've grown, um, both in the number of products that you're pushing out and the different threads that you're dying and, mm. and the people that are working with you. And um, so that's fantastic because I've always thought of dying sort of to be a little bit of science and an art, at least in the, yeah. in the experimentation phase. You know, as you're thinking about the color that you're trying to bring to life, whether it's a, a, a request from a friend or a, or a, a pattern designer to taking inspiration from your surroundings. So um, maybe can you tell us a little bit about um, when you select your colors, how you decide to name those threads? Is there, do you have a process in place as well for the way in which you name your threads? We started off very, um, just the like sweet pea and flowers that were from the cottage garden when you first started. Yeah. And then as we added more, thread colors in and it would come to naming them we just started having a bit of fun with it so there's some words that we've just completely made up like mossy pot um because it looks like a a terracotta pot with moss on it so we just called it mossy pot um yeah and further along in the range there is groupings of six you'll notice that are quite um that tie in they're like a mini palette Mm -hmm. and um from numbers 12 uh, 1301 upwards and so they were little collections on their own at one stage and so we named them and they're all, all have very um themed names so one of those is actually named after areas around us so that's the Baromi, Allenby, Delburn Delburn and Mardan. uh, Mardan. There's Mm -hmm. two more. Anyway, um, sorry what was that? Halston. 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 Sorry we've got (laughs) girls out the back. (laughs) Anyway yeah you'll be able to jump on um Red Thread Studio website and find out what all those are. And uh, yeah, so we have had a lot of fun with it. Um, One of the the names people often wonder why I named a thread Running Postman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is actually the name of a uh, native plant here in Western Australia. So it's not actually named after a postman running down the street. It is an actual... um, (laughs) It is an actual uh, uh, native plant here in Australia. Mm. Yeah. And I have to say, not having been to Australia, that was the exact thought running through my head. I just saw this little postman running <laughs> down the street. 
<laughs> maybe away from my dog or any dog for that matter. Um, but that's that's that's, nice, that's a great trivia question you you guys should have. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, when, yeah. when we do events, actually, that's one thing that we do some trivia on um, on names and things like that. It's good fun. The yeah. there's a lot of uh, this one here is Rosella, so you know that's named after an Australian bird. There's quite a few Australian birds in there as well. Uh, and then the edit ranges are actually named um, by the designers who design that range. So uh, Brenda's traditional range are all French. French, French words because it's a French inspired range and Amy Callista's namesake range is all just hipster names um, and that goes with some patterns that are hipster animals personified mm -hmm. which are absolutely gorgeous then my range the topography range is actually named after the radio phonetic alphabet so alpha bravo charlie delta etc um and then we've got lisa maddox forage range which is named after all um fruits and flowers because she was a florist so uh that is bringing in bringing in that yeah so that's how i we don't have a place. range yeah i don't yeah. have my own she just, range she just needs to get onto it and do it yeah <laughs> yes absolutely um one thing I've noticed in my experience in using your threads and stitching field journal and some other things um, is I love the way that you've packaged your threads. So for any of you who embroider here that, that are watching cross stitch, uh, other surface embroideries, um, it's wonderful. It's, at least I've used the six stranded floss, although you guys do dye pearl cottons. Um, but I love the short, change in color that you have it, it just makes for a wonderful stitching experience um just mm. absolutely beautiful colors the way that they sort of blend then into one another and the length of the threads are ideal so tell us a little bit how you decided to um create your repeats or your color changes in your threads and uh the lengths of the thread well initially the idea when you're stitching a tiny little flower you need the colours to change very quickly. And the only way I could think of doing that, uh, because it's all totally hand done, um, mm -hmm. is to hand paint them. So basically everything is hand painted. Uh, when I design a colour, I have, say, three different colours in a, one skein. You have to be very aware when two colours merge together that they will create a third colour. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that third colour is, is not very pleasing to the eye. So a few things have to get changed around. Uh, the length of the thread, the reason I did that is because people are very, um, when they stitch, a lot of people think, oh, if I have a really long strand of thread, you know, I'm not going to have to re-thread the needle all the time. Really, that's not a good thing to do. About 50 centimetre length is, is about right. Dragging the thread and the needle through any sort of fabric, and some fabrics are quite uh, tightly woven, so they're quite uh, coarse, can uh, shred the, the thread over time. 50 centimetre length, that very, rare, very rarely happens, unless you're doing a very, very tightly woven uh, fabric, and that will happen very occasionally. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for doing that. The colour placement on the thread, you will notice that there's the same colour on each end mm -hmm. of the thread. So that when you start a design, you know, you start with a knot or a double back stitch or however you want to start your work. So you lose a little bit of that colour. And you can't stitch right to the very end of the thread because you have to finish it off. So by having the same colour on each end, when you continue on, you have the same length of colour of the same colour to continue on with. Another reason for doing it was to be able to do mirror image work so you could easily find the thread, the colour placement on the thread to start for the mirror imaging. And that's, that's basically how it was done. <laughs> Brilliant, I have to say, because as you said, leaving off um on other threads you know you've there's ultimately waste because you're snipping off to yeah. you know match the color um or it becomes awkward 
Um, we, ha we had one question that's come in and, and ladies, those of you watching, feel free to ask any questions you have of our guests today here in the comments. I can put them up on the screen. Um, the question I saw it here just a moment ago. Where did you go, Joey? Um, I see it. Are the threads color fast? Yes. Um, yes. So uh, they are color fast. We have instructions that are followed in the aftercare of your work. They don't need to be pre pre washed. They're ready to stitch with. And uh, so it's using hot water. And on the new packaging, there is actually some. Um, you won't be able to see it super clearly, but there is the aftercare instructions for your work. And so they are colour fast when you follow those instructions. Every now and again, um, if, if you use cold water, which a lot of people traditionally think that you would use cold water in um, using hand dyed threads. So what would happen there, if there is any leftover dye after the dyeing processes um, that hasn't been rinsed off, then it will be released and the background fabric, which is normally dry, if you're spraying it with cold water, will uh, wick up any, any liquid that's come off that thread. And if there is any non-active dye left, it will settle in, in the fibres of the background fabric. So people then think that the thread has, has bled um, and that the dye has run. But all that's happened is that Excuse it hasn't me. had a chance to rinse away. Sorry, we've just got a parcel come to the door. Mum's just going to open the door for the postie. Um, so, yes, uh, it just hasn't had a chance to be rinsed away. Like when you purchase clothes and you wear them and the first time you wash them and you put them in the washing machine, you don't actually see all of the dye that's coming off those clothes because it goes down the drain and away. Um, so, yeah, if you rinse your work instead of spraying it with cold water, just rinse it in hot water and it will rinse any of that away. But in saying that, it's very rarely that that happens. Sometimes with really stubborn, stubborn reds that may happen, um, but we do put them through several rinsing processes and each time the water at the end of the process is crystal clear. Um, so, yeah, but the, all the instructions are on the packaging um, to... Just check back and make sure that they're, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. they're awesome. Yep. Joy said, thank you. Aftercare is so important. Yes. And don't be frightened. A lot no, of people get no. very scared, but don't be frightened. It, it will be mm. fine. Yep. yep. I, when I'm stitching, I have clammy hands. And so my work always gets a little bit grubby no matter what I do. So pretty much all of my work needs to be, to be washed and yeah, just rinse it out under the tap. Don't have, to be, don't have to be super gentle mm. with it. No. 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 And just no, no, set it to air dry. Yes, just yeah. air dry it. Mm. I always, if I'm roll washing anything, I roll it up in a towel, mm -hmm. stomp on it a few times to get any excess water out of it, mm. and then air dry it. And yeah. then it's it's yeah. good and as And just well. iron it while when it, once it's dry, then give it an iron. Great. S same for any embroidery, flip it to... The backside mm. press. Well, yes. that's a really good segue, Jen. Uh, <laughs> we have a product called a pressing cloth. So this is a small version and we've also got a large. And these are, are for pressing your stitcheries. Mm -hmm. So you put their 100% wool and they're specially engineered wool for this purpose. You put your stitchery face side down and press it from the back and then what's going to happen is that the wool absorbs all of the stitches and they sink in and then your background fabric is pressed perfectly smooth on the top so you don't get any little wrinkles and bubbles around um, your embroidery and also your stitches won't get squashed. Um, they'll be beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, when you flip it yeah. back over and you can actually peel it off and you see the indentation of the stitches there. So they're a, they're a great thing that's going to come up a little bit later when we announce something special. Oh, very exciting. I love the little teaser there. <laughs> so before we get to some of the uh, up and coming products and such. Let's talk a bit about one of your very popular programs, at least for here, for us at Red Thread Studio, it was immensely popular. Um, it certainly helped carry us through the dark times of COVID. And that was uh, Field Journal Club. And even though you had challenges yourself, I mean, how many times were you guys in lockdown? 
in Victoria? Uh, a lot, yeah. A lot. Here in Victoria, I <laughs> think we have a record for the yep. the most in, in the whole world, I think, for lockdowns. So we were thrown into some pretty severe severe lockdowns for long periods of time, um, which, mean, which meant everything stopped really and um yeah and that's why there was there was a year's break for the field journal as we had to um regain our footing and, and get back to it but certainly those who had been doing the field journal and a lot of people have had a lot to catch up on with that so that was a great opportunity for them to to be working on their field journal and and be journaling what was happening around them at the time because that's not something that that happens all the time and to have that to look back on uh, of living through a pandemic and mm. have that actually documented along with the work has become yeah something very very special mm-hmm were you having premonitions when you thought about creating Phil Journal, about journaling this pandemic? Yeah, no, I didn't. And I'm so amazed at how much people actually embrace the concept. Um, I've actually got a journal here. Do you want to? Sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah, no, no, actually, that would be great. So for those of you who are watching that are not familiar with Field Journal Club, Katie will talk to you a bit about it. It's currently running through its final phase, um, but never fear, there'll be some op- options later for folks. But um, she's just gonna talk a bit about what the program was. And and if you could share as well, your inspirations. Um, Absolutely. For this yeah. Program. yeah. Uh, so what made me first think about designing the Field Journal Club was, um, well, I love, vintage embroideries and collecting those um but they're they're quite hard to find especially now that everyone's trying to to collect them themselves or if you go into what we call op shops what you would call thrift stores um you know they can be really expensive too they've cottoned on to the fact that everyone wants those so they can be really expensive and i thought well it would be really nice to be able to um Kind of do your own vintage inspired um, stitcheries and whenever I hold or see a vintage stitchery that someone has done many years ago I wonder what they were doing when they were stitching it what what was the year what was going on around them what were they thinking as they were stitching it um, because you don't know when you pick that up and that's why so many family heirlooms just end up in, in thrift stores or, you know, as, as dog blankets and stuff because people don't actually realise all of the thought and care and love that's gone into, into those pieces. Um, so that kind of made me think, well, what if we could actually document some of those things mm-hmm. so that in the future not only other people but we could look back and see what was going on around us at the time. Um, small things that you might not think are important but, like, what songs were playing on the radio, you know, what was the headline of the newspaper at the time? Yeah, what was going on around you? Who who did you just catch up with down the street or have a cup of tea with and uh, babies being born, you know, all of those things mm-hmm. in life um, that happen that you're thinking of as you're, as you're stitching and um, with your own thoughts, what's going on in your mind. And, yeah, it has become a way for people to document that when they wouldn't have normally journaled as such. Mm -hmm. They've never kept a diary or a journal (coughs) or anything, Um, but this gives them a reason to and an excuse to. And I encourage um, people to get their family involved or their friends. Uh, For example, when I was stitching up and it was actually the little block in, in the first one. So this one here is actually my son Will's block because when I was stitching that I was on the way to visit some friends with all my kids in a car and my husband was driving so I had a chance to do the stitching and we were going to visit friends from interstate at a caravan park about an hour away from us and so I was thinking oh beauty I'll get this done for the sample I need to get it done um I'll, I'm sure I'll get it done there and on the way back I'll, I'll have it done and while we were there, um, my son, he was about 13 at the time, he fell off a, a log and got a massive cut up his ankle and we had to rush him off to hospital and uh, he got 21 stitches 
now and and has a massive big scar so i wasn't able to get much more stitching done that day uh, it was a different kind of stitches but that memory is tied into this block now so when he sees this he knows that kind of belongs to him because that was the day that when he did his his um <coughs> injury on his foot so it creates this tangible connection between the work and the person and the people around them that are actually doing it. So not only do people end up with a, a quilt in the end, they end up with the story of the quilt as well. Um, some people I know that are doing it and their friends are doing it as well. They'll swap a block mm -hmm. and, they'll it and they'll fill in the journal page and they'll swap that. So then they're kind of a part of each other's as well, which I think is, is really beautiful. Or they'll get... Um, their grandkids or their kids to do a couple of stitches and even if they're absolutely horrible stitches it doesn't matter because it means that that person has um is now a part of that quilt so yeah it's very special and we've been away to lots of retreats um when it's not COVID time we, we kind of fly around the country to retreats and get to meet so many amazing women and and men as well so um and they they bring their journals so this is Field Journal, um, and they show me that it's full of pages that they've filled out and it told me that it's got them through some pretty hard times in, in their life um, and that has helped them get through that. So that just oh, gives me absolute goosebumps and it makes me really proud of, of what, what we've been able to achieve. And that's what gives us a fuel to keep it going as well. When we have big challenges like supply chain issues, which mm -hmm. is happening all around the world um at the moment it's just become a part of day-to-day -day life but it keeps us keeps us going we want to keep it going because we know how um how special it is to people and how much it means mm -hmm. so yeah this is this is the journal which you can uh you can make and these are the pages so this is just a sample here Oh, actually, I think I took them out for another purpose. I'll just get one of my nifty employees in the back there to grab me some journal pages, please. Stop the printer. Uh, yeah, is there some just hanging about there somewhere? I think in a in a tub with um, that's got to be taken down to the clubhouse. There is actually a spare pack in there. Oh, beautiful. So the way that we were. Um, we're doing it is that every month you'd receive a pack and there's a little spoiler for anyone who's not up to that yet <laughs> <laughs> with the four threads that that go into into that month and also um pre-transferred stitchery designs that are all ready to go with the um, stabilizer on the back so there you can literally pick it up from your the post office or your mailbox and get stitching straight away if you've got a needle with you well yeah always keep a needle in your bag yes we always <laughs> well if you have your the pouch that is yeah. a pattern with the with the uh, club you should have a needle in there ready to go anyway that is for keeping your projects in so that you can take them out and about stitching with you because that's getting in those few little moments um, of that, those waiting times and things like that is how you can uh, achieve a lot. So the Liberty of London fabrics as well in there and the journal pages, which is where the magic. So that has the instructions for um, and the stitching guides for the work. And on the other side is the journaling page. So that is where you can fill out the date and um, all those thoughts and things there. And then it op actually opens up. So you've got the trace off if you wanted to repeat that design. Um, you've got that there. And this can act as a block holder. So when you finished it, you, could, you can tape it into there with a bit of washi tape and hold it on that side hold it in there put it in your journal ready for the assembly at the end of that at the end of that year and also in there is a is a pouch guide so this i put in so that you could fold up scrunch up and put in your pouch 
to take out and about with you so that you're not going to destroy your journal page. And that way um, <coughs> you can just jot down some notes mm -hmm. and then look in the, in the journal page um, later because some people are a bit scared to... Um, yeah, that was me. Straight away, I want to do a bit of a, a bit of practice and, and really get um, what they want to do in there. So that's the format that it is currently. Uh, unfortunately, we're not taking any more signups for that. Um, it is coming to the end, but in saying that, we are going to bring it out in a book format, which is really exciting. It means that <laughs> anyone and everyone can do this, um, and you can use your own fabrics. Uh, from just scraps from your stash. You can get, you know, Liberty Fabrics if you want to use Liberty. Uh, you can do it on a different background if you wanted to. So that book will have, still have journal pages. So you'll be able to fill in the journal pages and um, and all the guides and the transfers as well. So it'll be a simple iron-on transfer um, that you can do. So you won't need to be tracing with that. So hopefully that will be out by the end of this um, year. So if you're watching and that's interesting, certainly let Jen know um, yes. mm -hmm. about that. So they'll be released in volumes. So as each year comes to the end, which is what we're uh, doing at the moment, the third instalment is up to, to month 11 right now. Um, so as soon as that gets up to month 12, then we will release that first year as a volume for the field journal. And then there'll be two more volumes to go with that. Um, with the club, there is, I should show, I've actually got the panel for the first year made up here. I'll do a, I'll just swipe yes, across. I'll die. Yes. See how that all kind of comes together. Wonderful. Yeah. And the, the stitcheries are all very different. And I wanted to, I did that on purpose so that it would look like a collection of vintage doilies and things that you've picked up from different places I didn't want them to all be exactly the same uh, type of stitchery so mm -hmm. we've got some more modern ones some really vintage inspired ones like this one is very much um, inspired by like an art deco doily and yeah so they all and you can see how they all kind of come together in the end to create this overall piece that you just um, keep finding new things with it's also, you know, quite a good sampler for the three colours mm, yeah. because the threads look different when they're stitched out than mm. than when they're in the skein. In the skein, some of them can be pretty garish, but when they're stitched out, they're they're a lot different mm. than than what mm. you're seeing in the skein. Yes. So this is a really good reference for mm. uh, the actual colours of the thread because you don't use a whole skein of thread. In, in each stitchery design, you're only using um, tiny little you know, bit. a little bit. And there is a um, nine threads, which are the field journal exclusive threads, which are a pack of greens and yellow and white and a black. Um, anything that goes into with flowers, you know, flowers mm -hmm. have leaves or they have stems and they have things. So that's a pack that you use throughout the club um, to to put together with the with the stitchery. So that's little hollyhock there and you can see the pink as well as the green that's used in there. So I just have to say it's absolutely brilliant in terms of um, being appealing to different crowds of folks, those who like to journal, those who enjoy the vintage embroideries or just embroidery in general. Um, but also, as Pam was saying, it's a sampler of your wonderful colors. And so it's a fantastic way for people to explore cottage garden threads and build what? Their thread stash. Who doesn't yes. want gorgeous threads um, in their sewing box? So. That's right. Oh, and I forgot to show you before, Jen. Sorry, when we were talking about the threads, that's just made me remember. Um, with the packaging we were talking about mm -hmm. before and the thread design. So, yeah, everything to do with the threads mum um who initially started started this whole thing there was so much thought put into uh each each part of the thread process and the thread design and that also includes the packaging as well mm -hmm. uh, so the packaging has we have a chance to you know tell our story a bit on the back there so you can get to know us um a bit better and this is the newest version of our packaging we're really exciting to release that 
Mm. Only last month. So, um, Jen, you're certainly the first one in the US to, yes. to get your hands on, on this new packaging. And uh, that has all the details there and instructions there on how to actually use the packaging as a system. So it's not just looking really cute. It's a way that you can store your threads. So if you pull down on the left-hand side there and pop that out and just untwist like that, you can actually store your thread, keep it in the packaging, which I've only just recently found out from the cross-stitching world that that's called a floss drop. So it's a built-in <laughs> floss drop uh, just to pop on a ring and, and you've got it ready to go. To get a stitching length out, separate that and then just hold there and give it a pull and it will come out. And it's not going to do it smoothly for me on camera, of course. Of course. <laughs> you can also uh, divide each one up into individual strands, if you like, as well, if you know you're only going to be using a couple. Okay, so I'm holding that and then I'll give that a pull and you've got your length there that's come out and the rest of them are still on there. Yes, brilliant. So that one is Rosella, so that one's which is Rosella. an Australian bird. And then you can see what mum was talking about before, how you've got the same colour on each end and the colours are mirrored. So up going, working their way up so that when it's like that, <laughs> um, you've got this, yeah, those colours there. So that's how the, um, how the packaging works. Fantastic. Sorry, now back to what you were saying before that I interrupted you. Oh gosh, that was 20 seconds ago. How am I to remember now? <laughs> Wait, mom, <it's> disappearing. <laughs> you guys are too cute. So let's have a little fun now. I'm going to ask you guys some fun questions and then we'll talk about what's coming up. Um, complete this sentence, Pam. When I'm not stitching or dyeing thread, I am. I'm looking after grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I'm knitting. Or I'm gardening. Sounds as little fun. housework as possible. And That's what is it. what is Katie doing when she's not stitching or dyeing thread? Um, looking after five children, probably the main thing. And what else are you doing, Katie? Rollerblading. Roll roller skating. Sorry, sorry. Roller derby. Roller so derby. yes, I. Um, I play roller derby and I also train uh, beginner skating uh, sessions, yeah, for for roller skating. So that is lots of fun. Wow, um, fantastic. And that's an opportunity for me to, to get out and kind of um, get a clear head because you can't think about anything else while you're thinking about not falling on your backside. So <laughs> it's good fun. I love that. So, yes, I am, if I'm not stitching, um, or I'm continually learning about um, business and business and um, yeah operations and all of that kind. Of, I'm a big big nerd, so I'm reading, um, always learning, and yeah. You guys are fascinating. This will be a fun one. What would you say, Katie, is your mom's worst stitching habit? Oh, what's your worst stitching habit? I don't know if you have a bad one. My oh, worst, well, it's a wonder you don't can't a remember this. My worst probably habit if I'm writing notes is that I tend to write on little pieces of paper, Yeah, which drives Katie mm. insane. And always diagonally, never on the lines. And she never does it on straight. I'm always, yeah. So mum does a lot of the sample stitching of the design. So I'll draw up a design and then mum... Um, we kind of share the the stitching of that. So, um, and I tell mum, you yeah, write down what what you've actually stitched there. Um, yeah, but I can decipher it. I can decode you it. You can, but it, yeah, it, it, yeah. So that's my worst um, habit. Yeah, if Is she it, if she writes um, notes for anyone else here, sometimes I have to decode them. 
probably I would say also trying to get too much out of the thread. Mm. Mm. Trying to go too far to the end when yeah. I yes yeah. yes that's yeah. mine. Too. Everybody does yeah. that, right? And yeah. then you've got yeah that yeah. you've got to thread the needle to get it through to the back, and yeah. then you just do a double yeah knot on the. Yeah. So it's taken you you know probably four or five times as long yeah. to right. get that one mm. last stitch out of it than to finish off. But if yeah. you if you've got only three stitches left to go to complete, you know, and you oh it's. Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. It's thread chicken. Yeah. You don't. Yes. <laughs> thread thread. <chicken. laughs> That's, That's a great one. I have to keep that. Use that one. Um, Joy has a question. Joy says, what is the name of Katie's roller derby team and what position do you play? Hey, so um, we are the Gippsland Rangers roller derby team. And I actually, um, one of our employees, Willow, is, um, is in my roller derby team as well. That's where we met. And I haven't, I've only just um, been working my way up through my levels. So I haven't bouted a lot, um, but I am finding my, my position. And I think that I would love to be a jammer. Everyone's going to have to go and research what this means now. I would love to be a jammer. I just don't know if I'm fit enough, so I'll keep working on that. Uh, but I love, it, it, yeah, every position blocking and, and I love the, the psychological side Um of, of roller derby and the strategy. <laughs> um, Suzanne asks, uh, I'd love to know what you're stitching right now. Ah, okay. So I am stitching. Can you, is there, I'm going to make one get up again. <laughs> this couch, this, her exercise. this couch is so low. Oh, I can't get out of it. It's beautiful, but it's very low. What? In here, Katie? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I'm stitching and I'm well behind. Everyone finished theirs a long time ago. Um, I am stitching this design, which is actually, this is Brenda Ryan's version. So all the edit designers did um, their own version of this, which is actually an illustration that I did of the front of our building here in Mervinor. So this is, and we call it where the magic happens. So this, yeah, this is where we are all inside here. If you were to look out on the street through this window, you would actually see mum and I sitting on the couch just in there. Um, so yes, and all the beautiful flowers coming out from behind an explosion of colour there. So that is Brenda Ryan's version. And I've actually got prepared, ready for, to show you in a minute. This is the... Mum stitched this one up. So that's like the signature range version with a bit of brighter colours there. So I'm stitching my version at the moment, still in a hoop, with the topography range. So that's all quite, um, the, the colours are, that I've picked out, some of them, so hotel, these are all inspired by kind of vintage rusts and metals and patinas, um, inks, dark, inky colours. So I'm going to put all of those in, ampersand, which is that dark grey <coughs> the building is in. So, yeah, that's what I'm I'm stitching at the moment in between field journal that we're doing every single month. Um, yeah, so I better get it, better get cracking. Um, with that. so that's actually going to be released very soon as a as a competition and a free download from our website so that everyone can stitch their own version and then we will judge them um, and each edit range designer will pick their favorite and then and that person will win um, a nice big prize so yeah wow. that'll be cool. very so soon. Exciting. <laughs> so exciting can't wait to hear more about that um Kathy Hamilton says, what is your favorite non-domestic Australian animal and has it made it into any of your designs? Non-domestic Australian animal. We do have a few um, strange ones. And around where we live, we are very lucky. We get to see them all the time. Um, we, yeah, we drive around and we see koalas, we see kangaroos, echidnas um, all Platypus. the time, platypus out in the bush. So I would say I like echidnas. 
Yeah, echidnas are really cute. We haven't got one of those in our range. The baby, what's a baby no, echidna? We do, a puggle. A puggle. So the last threads in the signature range, the group of six, is all um, baby animal names. So a puggle is actually a baby echidna. echidna. Yes. Oh. And we see lots of wombats too around. Yeah, and, a lot and of wombats. Yeah. And snakes. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're not, they're not Maybe so not nice. snakes so much, but... Yeah, I'm no. thinking we need to make a field trip to come visit you ladies and yes. see you for a while. Absolutely. And we'd love to come see you too. Mm -hmm. mm. Just yeah. need to get past this COVID restrictions here. But um, yeah. Yeah. Dot had a great advice. She stores her cards to the top hole in color palettes on large safety pins used for holding knitting stitches. Oh. Yes. That's great. a great, great idea. idea. Great yeah. idea, Dot. And I love wow. Dot's name because my youngest daughter name is Dot, and we call Dotty. Aw. So speaking of these safety pins, uh, it's kind of a notion. What is the one sewing notion you ladies can't live without? Okay, so what I just showed you before is it's it's a bit bigger than a notion, but. This is uh, a work cushion that I designed. So it's a bit of a funny shape because um, it actually does up at the back with a strap. You can bend that up so that you can sit it on your lap and it raises your arms to be in an ergonomic um, mm -hmm. position so that you're not getting neck and, um, and shoulder pain by leaning into your work. And there's also um, all pockets on it to that's why those threads are on there because you can sit there while you're working and have uh, your threads in there under those straps there is pockets on the other side underneath that strap where you can tuck um, a light and your scissors and lots of bits and pieces and pockets up on in the corners here so you can tuck um, scissors yeah whatever you like in here so that everything's on your lap um, as you're stitching right where you need it. You're not losing the scissors down the corner of the couch um, or putting your pins into the couch and then, yeah, them getting lost and family members sitting on them. And when you need to jump up in a hurry, because I only get little amounts of stitching time in between the kids and everything, so I can just pick it up, put it aside, jump up, do what I've got to do, come back, put it down um, and get started straight away. And you can also... Um, adjust the strap there's a few different buttonholes in there so that it doesn't have to be on such a, a high angle it can be flatter mm -hmm. if you are sitting up in bed to stitch or at a retreat or at a workshop you can rest it on the table too um, which is which is really great as well so that is my that's my favorite um and now is that a pattern yeah that is a pattern so that kind of ties in with the the competition because you can see here that we've put it in the sorry I'm it's very hard to do this as a mirrored. Um, we've put it into the centre of this of this cushion, so that yeah, that's available as a as a pattern, and will be um, within the next week or two available for yeah for order. So fantastic, folks watching or anybody on replay, if these are things of interest to you, let us know in the comments or send us an email info at redthreadstudio.com so we can be sure to stock these things. Um, and ladies, you've been so wonderful and generous with your time. And but before we go, I know you have a couple of announcements. Yes, yes before we yeah. sign off. So, okay. To celebrate, um, come here. I'm in. To I'm, in. <laughs> I'm <laughs> always getting I'm always getting bossed around. I need somebody to comment to my daughter. Just tell her to stop bossing me around. She loves it. Um so Yes, to celebrate us being uh, with you today and all the way, beaming all the way over into the USA, which is so exciting for us. And like you said, um, our threads are becoming mainstream over there and we um, are hoping that yeah, everyone can, can get a hold of them. And, and thank you, Jen, for, um, for being one of the very first stockers in America where everyone can purchase their threads and products and everything from. So we've got a little giveaway and we've got, we've got two and in that giveaway is a little bundle. Um, so we've got my favourite size hoop that we have and these hoops um, 
are fantastic. They're a beautiful quality timber. They won't snag uh, on your work. And the thing I love most about them is they actually have a screwdriver mm -hmm. fastening. And we have little screwdrivers. Um, I might pop one of those in as well that you can use to, to do it up so that you can get that drum tight tension. Uh, and also if you have a bit of trouble with your hands, um, any like arthritis hands or, or a bit weaker hands, it's great just to get that screwdriver in there so you um, can do it up tighter than just with your fingers. So that, that little hoop is in there. And like I showed you before, pressing cloth, small pressing cloth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can do something about that, Jen. And we have sorry two different sets of threads that were picked out by our lovely Courtney can you hold them up so we've got one set of threads there Ooh. and mum's got another set of threads there this is not easy <laughs> from the bottom all right so and there is the other set there and a pattern for this pouch which is called the handy dandy daisy drawstring bag because i always think i'm funny when i'm designing things and um then regret the names later so that is actually a sample for being able to use this little gadget here. Um, so this is something I've invented called the Tack It Easy. And what this does is helps with your English paper piecing. Um, and in the pattern, you also get the papers to try out for the glue basting method um, for tacking so that you don't get all sticky fingers um, and makes it really easy to do and nice, crisp corners, um, perfectly measured edges uh, so that's a chance for you to try that that's um, yeah. another product that we have the tack it easy um, tack it easy things so that pattern will give you those as well so that's there in the giveaway hmm. wow what a fabulous so giveaway Fantastic. Okay, folks watching, this is for those of you attending live. I'm sorry for those of you watching on replay. But um, what I think we'll do, uh, Katie is giving away two lovely little um, packages and uh, that she shared here. And so what I thought we would do, everybody watching, we're going to send some love to Katie and Pam on the other side of the pond. Well, even further than that. Um, and just put in the comments either a heart emoji or type the word love or heart. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna randomly select two people for these giveaways. And uh, they're gonna be shipped out with our next delivery of Field Journal Club. And so once we get those here in the studio, we'll get uh, this info out to you. So go ahead in the comments, send Katie and Pam some love right here. You can see all the love coming in. Can you ladies see it coming in in the comments we here? Can. We can. We can. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Keep that love coming in, guys. And I'm going to go ahead and get ready to select a random number. Uh, and two lucky winners are going to receive one of these packages. All right. Has everyone sent their love? Excellent. Okay. So here we go. The first winner is... Joey, Joey Metley, you're the winner of one of these wonderful cottage garden packages, cottage garden threads. Thank you. And I know where you live. She happens to live up the road, so that'll be easy. And the second winner of our giveaway is, all right, number was drawn and here we go. Suzanne Parker, you are the second winner. Congratulations to you. Well done. Woo! Awesome. How fun. Thank you so much, ladies, for taking your morning to celebrate with us and to share a bit about your history, your journey, um, the processes that you have at Cottage Garden Threads. I found it fascinating. I really and truly did. I hope everybody watching um, got a little something out of today's presentation. Um, 
So thank you. thank you. And for those of you who are interested in Cottage Garden Threads outside of the Field Journal Club or uh, the new presentation of them as journals, um, we will be stocking those here at Red Thread Studio. I'm hoping to uh, um, uh, the the product listing for the threads um, should be available later tonight or tomorrow. So come check us out at redthreadstudio.com. If you're already on our newsletter, we're going to have the big announcement uh, with product links in our weekly newsletter, which will be next Tuesday. And um, if you are watching on replay again, if you had any question for these lovely ladies, this dynamic duo, the mother daughter team, I love it. You guys are way too cute. Just let us know here in the comments. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope everybody else has a wonderful rest of their day. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in. Thanks so much, Jen. Thank you.